Cisco CCNA1 Introduction to Networks. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. This is Chapter 4, Network Access. At the end of this chapter, students will be expected to explain how physical layer protocols and services support communications across a data network. They'll be able to build a simple network using the appropriate requirements. They'll also be able to explain the role of the data link layer in supporting communications across data networks and compare media access control techniques and logical topologies used in networks. Let's get started. This is a common home router. You can see it as an embedded wireless antenna. Actually can't see that because it's hidden inside of the chassis, but it does have an embedded wireless antenna. It also has an ethernet switch embedded. You can see those, the blue ports, one, two, three, and four. That would be the LAN interface. There's also a WAN interface, which is the yellow internet. So there are really three interfaces on this home router, a Wi-Fi interface for wireless clients internal to your LAN, a wired LAN interface switch for devices internal to your LAN, and an external WAN interface to connect to a cable or DSL provider. You can see how you would plug a computer into this device. You can also get additional wireless extenders that would extend your wireless network throughout your house. And in many homes today, wireless is the predominant technology that we use to interconnect the devices within our home. Reasons for this are cost, and it's much easier to run wireless signal through your house than running wires. If we look at the OSI model, which is the seven layer model of encapsulation, we can see that the physical layer is where the bits meet the wire. The wire called the media could be a copper plant wire, it could be a fiber optic wire, or it could be radio frequency. But in every case, the ones and zeros called bits are transcoded or encoded into an electrical signal, a light signal, or a radio frequency signal to transport across that wire. You can see some illustrations here of what that signaling might look like if you were looking at it, at it on an oscilloscope, which is a device that allows you to look at analog signal traveling on a wire. Some standards organizations involved in setting the standards for physical layer would be the ISO, they're the folks that brought us the OSI model, or EATIA, which is the Electrical um, Institute of America, or the Telecommunications Institute of Technology of America. <coughs> Sorry, two organizations that jointly release standards related to layers one and two. ANSI, the American uh, National Standards Institute, the International um, Telecommunications Union, the ITU, and of course IEEE, which is the uh, International Electrical Engineers, and they uh, represent 30 countries around the world. As I alluded to earlier, we have currently three mediums by which we can send our physical air signaling, copper, fiber, and wireless. When we talk about bandwidth, we can measure bandwidth digitally or in an analog sense. Analog bandwidth is measured in hertz or cycles per second. So the higher the cycles per second, the higher the bandwidth. This slide deals with digital bandwidth, which is how much data can move through a wire in a second. So it could be bits per second or kilo or mega or giga or terabits per second. The flow of data per second. Throughput is different than bandwidth. Bandwidth, the last slide, dealt with the theoretical maximum, the maximum amount of data that we could, under an ideal situation, get through the wire. Throughput is the actual amount of data we can get through the wire in a given situation. We can look at the different types of physical media 
That would be radio frequency and fiber optic and copper media. We can also look here are a variety of different port types, the connectors that these um, physical media use. We could use Ethernet ports or we could use DSL ports as an example. Here's an artist's illustration of copper cabling. On the top, you can see what's called the UTP, unshielded twisted pair cabling, where we have eight wires and they are coiled into four pairs. In the bottom illustration, we have STP, or shielded twisted pair cabling, where we have the same eight wires paired into four pairs, and each pair is shielded by a foil shield. Characteristics of copper media. Copper is basically a giant antenna, and the longer you run the copper wire, the more interference it will accrue. So you can see there will be interference added to the wire over time. That interference is added to the original pure digital signal, resulting in a signal that is an amalgamation of the pure digital signal and the interference. So the receiving computer must discern the original digital signal out of the added interference as shown in the lower right corner slide. For cost effectiveness, we almost always use UTP or unshielded twisted pair cabling. Shielded twisted pair cabling with the foil shield or shields requires a ninth pin to ground that shielding on both ends. Coaxial cable, the type on your television set, also has a shield, be it foil or a web mesh, and that shield is also grounded. The PVC jacket, the bright colored jacket on the outside of the cable simply provides a protection from abrasion. It has nothing to do with the signal protection. If you do shielded twisted pair, they add a metal shield, be it a braided shield or a foil shield. You would have the outer jacket, the added shield, and then some plastic insulation, and then the conductor. This is typical of a coaxial cable. These are three types of connectors that can be crimped onto coaxial cable. The F-type connector you're already familiar with screws into the back of your television set. The N and the BNC type are used in data networking. When we deal with copper media, we must be aware that copper cable can transport high voltage. So we need to route our cabling away from high voltage electrical cabling, and we need to be careful to make sure cable is correctly connected, inspected for damage, and properly grounded. UTP is the simplest and cheapest of the copper cabling. UTP comes in several different standards called CAT or category. Category numbers as they escalate in value are a higher quality. So a category seven cable is much higher quality than category six. Category five and five E can transport 10 and 100 megabit signaling. Category six can, cat, can handle gigabit Ethernet and category seven is for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Category three is 10 megabit and um, analog telephone. This is an RJ45 connector for UTP. For STP, you would have a metallic shield on the outside of this cable to provide the grounding or ninth pin connection. The types of UTP cable, you could have a straight through cable, which would be used as the typical 90 plus percent of cabling where you're connecting an end device to a switch. A crossover cable is a specialty cable used in extreme situations when you need to interconnect two like devices, like a router to a router, a PC to a PC, or a switch to a switch. A rollover cable, is a very proprietary specific cable for providing keyboard 
and uh, video controls to a remote device like a Cisco router or switch. If you want to test a UTP cable, you need to use a tester. A network, table, a network cable tester is a device that will tell you what each pin on the cable is doing. Fluke, the company we use in our class, provides some high quality network cable testing equipment. Fiber optic cable is not prone to any of the problems of copper cable. It is not a large antenna, it does not conduct electricity, and it is not prone to interference from the um, magnetic or the radio frequency spectrum. They do put a PVC jacket on the outside of fiber optic cable that is to protect the inner glass cable from abrasion or other problems. In the glass, you have two glasses. You have the core and you have the buffer. If we were to take a look at the core, we have two diameters of core. Single mode fiber would use a nine micron core. If you are going to use multi-mode, you will have a 50 or 62.5 micron core, a much larger core. A single mode fiber is the industry standard and has the highest performance. It only sends one burst of light at a time down the very narrow core. It can go up to 25 kilometers. On a multi-core fiber, it sends multiple light signals simultaneously and is much lower cost. It can actually use plastic instead of glass for the core material and it could use LEDs instead of lasers as the light sources. It is commonly used for limited distance applications and can currently only support up to 10 gig speeds. Many different connectors are available to attach to the ends of your fiber optic cabling. Some of those are shown here. ST connectors are the oldest, sometimes called a barrel connector, and the newer connectors are square avoiding the problem of having the wrong connector in the wrong place. SC and then the smaller LC connector and the newest LC, which has a duplex um, attachment on it, allowing uh, the two LC connectors, the send and the receive, to be affixed into a single connector body. This is a signal tester for fiber optic cable, which is measuring the dB loss on the dB gain on the light signal as it travels down the fiber optic cable. Fiber versus copper. Fiber wins in every possible comparison except for one, which isn't shown here, and that's cost. Fiber optic currently costs much more than copper cabling, three to five times the cost at a conservative estimate, but it does provide many benefits. Wireless has become the new way to connect devices. It's absolutely essential when you're talking about mobile devices. And you can see here the wealth of devices from PDAs to satellite, to your television, to a uh, mouse or a keyboard or headphones or a mobile phone. There are many wireless devices today. And as we get smaller, more mobile devices, we will look to wireless as our method for connecting them. Some of the wireless standards fall into the categories of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and WiMAX. Wi-Fi is LAN-based standards designed for your wireless LAN within your company. And you can see here a list of those standards which have the elevated speeds as we move to newer standards. The current standard this year would be 802.11ac, which is called the 1 gig standard. You can buy the equipment today but many folks are still using N, G, B, and A standards within their network. Bluetooth is a popular way to connect peripheral devices, speakers, microphones, keyboards, and mice, and other peripherals within a limited distance at a limited speed. WiMAX is a cellular technology for connecting devices within the WAN, 
or outside of the company premises and can be used to provide internet access for remote devices in the WAN environment. If we were to look at the wireless LAN, this is a Cisco wireless router. Under Wi-Fi, as Wi-Fi evolved from A, the original standard, you can see that it's the first and only time the speed dropped. A and B were actually competing standards where A provided a much higher speed and B a much lower speed, but in exchange, and it's not shown here in the table, B provided a much longer range. So A could only go about 40 feet and B could go about 300 feet. So B could go a much longer range, but at a lower speed. Additionally, as you can see here, they use different frequencies. When we went to G, we were able to get the speed of A with the backwards compatibility of B because it uses the same frequency. So with G, for the first time, we can go 300 feet and get 54 megabits per second. This evolved to N, which combines the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz spectrum together to provide up to a half gigabit of bandwidth. Then we move to AC, our current standard called the gig standard, which again uses 2.4 and 5 gigahertz to provide a collective 1.3 gigabits per second of throughput. And we're moving to AD, which will increase that substantially by adding a new third frequency, the 60 gigahertz frequency. And so 802.11d will be able to operate on any and or all of those three frequencies. As data is created by the user, it travels downward through the seven layers of the OSI model, out the physical layer, across the wire, and onto the network. We sometimes look at sublayers. There are not just seven layers, there are sublayers to these seven layers. If we were to look at the second layer, the data link layer, we would see it is subdivided into two sublayers, the MAC and the LLC. The LLC is essentially the driver software that would drive the network interface card. The MAC sublayer is the encoding that is burned into the physical card that you put in the computer. That physical card supports one type of Ethernet signaling, be it the wireline 8023 Ethernet or wireless 80211 or Bluetooth 80215. That signaling would travel through the physical layer and up halfway through the layer two data link layer where it would hand off to the software driver at the LLC sublayer and then move on to the network layer which is the operating system. Media access control. One of the concerns with media is controlling access on and off of the media. It is the job of layer two to move frames on and off of the physical media. Providing access to the media. The data link layer is also responsible for providing access to a physical connection. Layer 2 frame structure, if we look at the data link layer, it consists of a header with some addressing information, a um, type and control information, then the data packet from the upper layer, and it is encapsulated with a trailer which has some error detection and a caboose that tells us the frame has ended. When you want to create a frame, you would take the data from layer 3, the network layer and you would encapsulate that packet of data with a header on the front and a trailer on the rear. The header would consist of a fr uh, frame start delimiter or start frame delimiter which is a sequence of ones and zeros which indicates the beginning of the frame. You would then have the to and from MAC addresses identifying who this frame was from and who it was addressed to. You would have a type field identifying what the payload of this frame is, in this case an IPv4 packet. You could have some control information and then at the end you would have a CRC or FCS redundancy check to make sure that the data was not compromised in transport or air detection. And then a sequence of ones and zeros that indicates the frame has come to an end. 
If we look at these standards laid out across the OSI layers, you can see how the IEEE standards function from layer one up through one half of layer two. And then we have 8022, the upper half or LLC sublayer of layer two, the driver software for our NIC, transferring this physical information into software for the operating system. These are the standards organizations involved at Layer 2, essentially the same standards organizations we had for Layer 1. If we want to control access to the media, we're going to rely on Layer 2 to look at the frame and decide the appropriate encoding for the media we are using, be it fiber or copper or radio frequency. We should talk a moment about physical versus logical topologies. You can see in the bottom left corner the physical topology that defines how devices are actually physically laid out within a geographic space like a building or a uh, campus. And that would show each computer where it is, how it is cabled to the routers and the switches. And in the upper right corner you will see the logical diagram which shows how the devices are actually cabled together in a logical way. Some of the physical topologies would be point to point, one device cabled to another. We also have hub and spoke where many devices cabled to a switch or hub. And we have full mesh, typically seen with routers where we interconnect the routers so each router can talk to every other router. Here's a physical point to point, two routers directly connected. They can only talk to each other. They are a point to point or P2P network. Half and full duplex. Half duplex is like using your CB radio. You can only talk and they can only listen and then you change turns with Full duplex, you can talk, they can listen, they can talk, you can listen. You can send and receive simultaneously. Here are those physical LAN topologies again. You can create a star where you have a hub in the center and you interconnect multiple end devices. An extended star is simply several hubs interconnected with end devices connected to them. A bus topology is the idea of having a coaxial cable that a number of devices are cabled to. Comcast uses this for their cable internet service. A ring topology would be like IBM token ring where the devices are physically cabled into a circle. A logical construct is either contention-based or controlled. In contention-based, that's Ethernet. Everyone just tries to talk on the network, and if someone else happens to be talking, there's a collision and everyone backs off. In a controlled access environment, each device has its own time slot in which to talk without fear of a collision with another talker. Our road system, if you want to use an analogy of pulling out of the college and driving on the roads as you go home, you would be in a contention-based access system where you look for an opening and take it. In a controlled access situation, you would predefine when you would go and you would know when your time slot is. You would go and you would have no fear of collision. It is much less efficient to use a controlled access methodology for logical topologies. Contention-based, multi-access. Multi-access means that more than one device has access to the media at one time. Controlled access. Controlled access typically has a ring or turn-based topology where each device takes a turn controlling the media. The frame. In a fragile environment, more controls are needed to ensure that the frame makes it successfully from point A to point B. In a protected environment like a LAN, we really don't need many controls. Who cares if we get an error? We can always resend it again. 
So on the WAN, that would be a fragile environment. A LAN would be a protected one. The header of the frame includes the start frame delimiter, as I spoke to, is a simply a repeating sequence of ones and zeros to indicate the beginning of the frame. You would then have to and from address information and length and type information. You would insert the packet in the data field, have a frame check sequence for error checking, and then indicate the end of the frame. Layer 2 addressing, sometimes called the burned-in address or the MAC or hardware address, is a 48-bit number that is provided in the network card to identify that device uniquely on that network segment. The Ethernet frame specifically looks like this. You'll want to get it in your notes for the exam. The preamble is eight bytes long. Then you have a source and destination address. Each is six bytes. Six bytes, by the way, is 48 bits because their MAC addresses, they're 48 bits long. Remember that eight bits are a byte, so six times eight is 48. You would then have a length type field the data field, which includes the packet, and then the error checking. Notice there is no end of frame field. It would look like this. This is a point-to-point -point frame, or PPP frame, and you can see that it is much shorter in terms of the fields. This is a wireless frame. Notice it has additional fields added in addition to regular Ethernet frames to provide power management and collision protection. In summary, we've looked at the physical layer protocols, the network media, the data link layer protocols, and the media access control mechanisms that the network uses.